camera, then it's my blood pressure to work on top of the green gene uh, from 10th stage. And Dr. Jim graduated from Nanjing University in China and uh, okay. in mass and PhD in architecture acoustics from Bernstein Alcoholic Institute. And he has been uh, in one of the fellows at uh, Brennan and Women's Hospital and uh, the associate professor at the North Carolina State University. Uh, and currently, he is uh, at a graduate program in acoustics at Penn State University since uh, 2020. And he has published uh, many important papers in, in the acoustic area and uh, currently is a fellow of uh, acoustic society of America, city member of ICB, and associated with the Journal of Society of America and Frontier in Nigeria. And uh, please join me. Thank you. thank you, Professor Chen, for the uh, introduction and for the uh, invitation. Um, very happy to be here. Um, not because I get to uh, share with you my research, but also I get to show the right here. Uh, coming from Pennsylvania, uh, I get you, know, you guys have every day, Sunday day, and we have like one Sunday every week. That's the best, best thing I get. Um, so I'm very happy you know, to be here. Um, so just very briefly on all of that at Penn State. Uh, so I moved to Penn State 2020, and before that, I you know, spent some years at North Carolina State University. Um, so over, I was in a you know, graduate program in Crystal Valley. I guess not many people know that program, but we are the only program in the US that offers PhD in acoustics, uh, which is pretty unique. Um, so I named my lab the Sound Innovation of Meta Materials and Biomedical Acoustics Lab, uh, Simba Lab. So there are two other things called Simba, right? Uh, if you're like me, like a big fan of Lion King, uh, the main character is called Simba. Uh, another thing that's called Simba is the Penn State Financial System is also Simba, but it's, it's a very, very bad system for medicine. Everybody complains about that system. Anyway, um, so. That's our lab, and uh, in, so in our lab, we do uh, different research related to acoustics. Um, for example, we do research on numerical modeling. Uh, we propagation mostly on magnetic ultrasound, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we also do uh, some research on imaging. Um, so this is a photocoast imaging. So I have some collaborators who um, you know, I work with to do photocoast imaging, and there's actually some connection between uh, numerical modeling and photocoast imaging, which I will touch on a little bit today. Um, uh, something I'm very different from medical ultrasound side. The other side of the research we do is uh, related to um, some periodic uh, artificial man-made materials, uh, photonic crystal, of uh, non-crystal, sorry, uh, crystal matter materials where we uh, use, design those materials to manipulate sound and the vibration in the way that neutral materials that not do. Um, so this is kind of like a, a quick introduction of our lab. So, like I said, um, today I'm going to be focusing on uh, our research on numerical modeling of crystal waves. Um, so here is a, a snapshot of a showing the acoustic pressure distribution in a acoustic medium. Right. So, for example, you can imagine that we have a focused transistor here. What we wanted to understand is how does the sound, how does ultrasound uh, propagate in this uh, in the biological tissue, let's say. Um, let's say if you have something that is in the middle, does that affect the focusing effect? That's something the question we want to answer by using numerical modeling because it's very hard to, to do that uh, by you know, experiments. So uh, I'm going to break this down to two different uh, types of scenarios. One is you have homogeneous media, uh, like to say water or very soft tissue, which is pretty homogeneous. Or we have inhomogeneous media. For example, when we're talking about transcreening ultrasound with salt, it's very different from brain tissue. So that you have to consider inhomogeneous media in that case. Um, so, and the, the uh, solution methods are you know, very different for these two types of scenarios. So let's start with the simple case, which is homogeneous uh, media. Okay, so I was told that most people here 
uh, in optics, so I don't want to spend too much time on the equation. Uh, but um, here we have the most fundamental uh, term, uh, equation, the way equation you know, we deal with every day. Uh, here I'm introducing two other terms. One is attenuation, um, and uh, the other one is modularity. So the reason why this modularity is important as in optics or nonlinear optics. Um, the reason why this is, is important because sometimes when we do high intensity focus ultrasound, the correction can get really high, and then you have to consider the nonlinearity very carefully. And what that does is that if you have a plane wave pattern uh, to this direction, what happens is that the positive peak pressure travels a little bit faster than the negative peak pressure. So as you can see, as it travels, uh, the two points are gonna go kind of go this way, so resulting in the distortion of the wave. So that's what happens in the time domain. You get that distortion in the time domain. If you look at the frequency domain, you get this, you know, start with the fundamental frequency f, but then as the wave propagates, you start to have harmonics, so two f, three f, so on and so forth. Uh, eventually, you get sharp waves, you get discontinuity at the wave drop. Um, so, so even homogeneous case, uh, it's not sometimes can get very tricky to study because you have, you have nonlinearity, not very easy to model. So the wave equation uh, is a partial differential equation. So you have uh, the uh, Laplacian term, you have x, the derivative of x, y, and z. You also have the time temporal derivative. So that's the part of the PDE. So this PDE is not very easy to solve. So we wanted to convert this to kind of ordinary differential equation, OD. So what we do is I will apply the Fourier transform uh, in the x direction, y direction, and the temporal uh, domain. So that will give you a equation in the so-called wave vector frequency domain, or in other words, k space frequency domain. Okay. Uh, so that's the kind of the ordinary differential equation that we're looking at. So the pressure now is in the kx, ky, uh, or the uh, kind of uh, wave vectors frequency domain. So, um, so this equation can be solved by a one-dimensional Green's function. Um, actually, I was working on this when I was postdoc at Brigham Women's Hospital. It took me quite some time to figure that out. Um, so, so basically, you will start with this value here, this is known, and then you would want to use this marching algorithm to get to the next plane, z plus db. Okay, so that's kind of the marching algorithm. So, so um, I guess another way to explain this is uh, you first start with uh, a pressure distribution on a on your starting plane. For example, imagine that this is your starting plane, and you have a transduce ultrasound transducer here that is vibrating. So you have some you know, displacement uh, or velocity or pressure on this plane, and elsewhere it's going to be zero. So that's you start with this initial plane, and you want to you know predict what will happen as it propagates throughout the domain. So you first do what you do is that you apply the Fourier transform. Spatial for the transform to this um, kind of pressure distribution, then you get a function in the wave vector domain, so Px, y. Um, so, and then you use the marching algorithm to get to the from one plane to the next. So, it's from the z plane to z plus delta z okay, by using that marching algorithm, uh, and then. Okay, so you get this um, pressure distribution. This is in the spatial type, so a spatial frequency domain. You have to convert this back to the real spatial domain. So you apply the uh, inverse for a transform. Now you get to the uh, pressure distribution uh, in the real spatial domain. Okay, so that's kind of how this works. Okay. Um, another angle to look at this is that you start with a, a source plane. It could be the plane uh, where you have the transducer surface. Okay, so you can take any point to look at the, uh, the pressure distribution. This is the time. Okay. And uh, as by using this marching algorithm, you actually you're marching in the z direction. Okay. So you go to the next plane by using the marching scheme that I just described. And uh, you can see that uh, picking the, look at the same point, the wave is actually, you can see the wave moving in the, in the positive p direction. You can just basically keep going like that. You can then you can map out the pressure field in this entire three D domain. Okay. Um, another interesting about this is that 
uh, you can actually do the, uh, the other way around. So if P of C is a solution to that equation, this equation here, uh, this equation is the second order derivative and second order derivative with respect to C. Uh, so what that means is that P negative C is also a solution. So it has this uh, spatial symmetry here. Uh, so what we can do is that we can simply replace C by negative Z and that would lead us to us being able to backward propagate them. Uh, so you imagine that you can measure uh, the pressure field somewhere on a plane away from the transfer surface. You can propagate some backward towards the source, to, to, towards the transfer surface. Okay, so let me ask, what can you do with this, right? So a couple of years ago, there's a paper published in Nature where they are. Uh, uh, design a technique that they can use, generate a certain uh, crystal pressure pattern to manipulate particles. You can actually, because acoustic wave have, um, they have this radiation force. So you can trap particles at certain location, you can even form a very beautiful bird, you can see here. Um, but the question is, if I want to generate such a crystal, to make the crystal pressure distribution, how do I know uh, what kind of source do I need? So you can actually use this spectral propagation to kind of extrapolate what you need to have on your uh, transducer surface. Okay, so this is what you can do with backward propagation. So you can do forward propagation, you can do backward propagation. Um, so, um, so we have to see whether this model is valid, right? So we did some uh, experiments a few years back and uh, we actually started with a very extreme case. Um, the pressure, we, um, okay, so let me show you. So this is the experimental setup. Um, so basically we have a transducer here. We have a fiber optic, uh, a hydrophone here. It measures the, uh, scan the uh, pressure along three planes. So pre-focal, uh, so measure plane, pre-focal and focal plane, okay? So what we did was we take the measure plane, the pressure on the measure plane, we uh, propagate that forward to the pre-focal plane and to the focal plane. And we can compare the measurement with the simulation. So here is the comparison between uh, simulation experiment at pre-focal plane, so it's five millimeter before the uh, ultrasound focal plane. As you can see, we can already have very high uh, pressure. So the negative peak pressure is very important because that is a good indication whether you have cavitation or not. So we can already have negative 15, uh, might ask how to make peak pressure. Um, we keep going and we now we propagate the field to the focal point and see the pressure. The positive peak pressure is 200 mm. That's really high pressure. At that point, it's you know, super nonlinear. Uh, so we are actually generating uh, very strong shock waves at that point. Um, but you know, I was happy to see a very nice agreement between the simulation and the experiment. Uh, even though the pressure is highly nonlinear. So why, why is this important, okay? So whenever you have a, such a high pressure, uh, it's gonna be very challenging to measure uh, the pressure. But if, if you use traditional hydrophone, uh, it's gonna break the hydrophone for sure. So that's why people use optical um, fiber hydrophone. It's less sensitive to high pressure, but still you can break the hydrophone. It's very, that's very expensive, okay? so. Um, there's a company called History Sonics. They, uh, they kind of, the technology is based on generating those very high pressure crystal waves. Um, so basically, if you have a focus uh, ultrasound, and what you can do is you can generate a, a cavitating um, bubble clouds. Okay, so these bubbles are collapsing, they're generating cavitation, and the bio effect is that it's completely mechanical. And so you can actually cut a hole through a soft tissue by uh, using this very high pressure. Ultrasound. Okay. Uh, for them, the challenge is that if they want to get through the FDA, they need to submit the data to FDA, including the acoustic field of this, the transducer. Uh, for them, it's very difficult to measure the uh, acoustic field because uh, they, they can easily break the, the optical hydrophone, uh, optical fiber hydrophone. So we are using actually using all the simulation to help them uh, to predict the pressure field of the hydrophone of the transducers. So modeling can certainly play a very important role in facilitating the FDA submission of new therapeutic opportunities. So that's kind of one application of American modeling. I have a quick question. Yeah. Is the black region the area of the ultrasound focus? 
Uh, black mission. Yeah, yeah. There, this is uh, yeah. This is focusing. And what you're seeing here is a focus. Right, right. That's visual kind of visualized yeah, yeah. for vision. So when you're doing those simulation, do you have to see the bubble with a certain where does the original bubble come from? When we do simulation, that's a good question. When we do simulation, we actually do not consider the bubbles because if you wanted to do that, you have to consider interaction. Okay, okay we, first, we only consider the first wave and the first wave will generate bubbles. So we only consider the first part. Okay. If you want to study the interaction between ultrasound and bubbles, I'm not sure if you can do model that. It's super complicated. Um, Okay, so that's forward propagation. Uh, I also want to show you, we can do back propagation. So here it's a, almost the same setup. Uh, we measure the sound field at the post focal point plan, we back will propagate that to the pre focal plane. We can compare the simulation with measurement. Um, so, so here, this side is showing the positive peak pressure uh, distribution, and this side is showing negative peak pressure distribution. Uh, so the top you can see it's a little bit noisy data, so that's what you could be from the me measurement. The bottom two are from the simulation, a little bit smoother. Uh, but overall, you can see the distribution is very similar. Uh, and so again, the negative peak pressure is, is very important because that is associated with cavitation. So you want to know where are you getting these negative peak pressure? How high are they? Because we want to make sure the confinement in a certain region, you don't want to have cavitation. In other places, you don't intend to damage. Right? Okay, another application you can do with this uh, vertical propagation is that uh, you can use this technique to uh, study the uh, the pressure distribution or vibration pattern on transducers. Right? For example, I mean, this is from another group out of the University of Washington. Um, so they basically, like I said, they can measure the pressure field on the plane away from the source and they backward propagate that back to the source plane. Uh, for example, if you look at this phase array, this is what the uh, uh, simulation uh, gave us, give them. Uh, you clearly see uh, seven uh, individual, the seven individual elements. So if one of the elements is not working, maybe this is to tell which one is not working. Okay, so um, moving on to another interesting application of numerical uh, modeling of ultrasound, which is we can use that to do cavitation mapping. So um, again, ultrasound can create cavitation. So basically, um, ultrasound can generate bubbles. There maybe there are only bubbles in the in the tissue already. Anyway, so once you have the bubbles, and the bubbles on the ultrasound they oscillate. And if the pressure is high enough, these bubbles, they grow and they collapse, and that generates cavitation, inertia cavitation. There's another type of cavitation called stable cavitation, so we just oscillate, and that you know, has some other applications. People use that to open up a lot of barriers, uh, so less uh, violent effect compared to inertia cavitation. Um, so anyway, so you know, in high school, people mostly use inertia cavitation, so these bubbles, they collapse, they generate very high temperature, low temperature, can enhance, um, so what happened is that when the bubble collapses, like if we blow up the balloon, uh, so we get this impulse. Uh, the impulse would is, is the average ultrasound, right? so it propagate away and it gets picked up by the, for example, you have ultrasound uh, being array here that's picking up the signal, right? And uh, the question we wanted to ask is where are the bubbles? Right? How do you know the, uh, you know the location of the bubble uh, from this? Um, for some uh, information, okay. So the conventional approach is called type of delay and sum. Um, so, for example, if you have a bubble here, um, this, the time it takes for this the cavitation signal to travel from this bubble to this element is a little bit shorter compared to traveling to this one here because it's further away. It's not. So, if you look at time domain, so the you get this signal a little bit earlier than this one here, okay. To do time uh, delay and sum, basically, you would delay the signal, and this one here, so that these three, they line up. And now you add them up. Uh, they add up constructively, so you get a, something, a much stronger signal. So uh, in a 2D image, a BMO image, you see a bright spot, it tells you that's where the bubble is. 
Um, so that has been used widely for cavitation uh, mapping, uh, passive cavitation mapping, very, very useful monitoring uh, tool to, uh, to, to monitor high flow actually. But the, uh, so this is basically what you get if you use the layer sun, you get image of where the bubble is at. Um, the limitation of this is that um, for high for high intensity focal ultrasound, it's very effective. But uh, for laser tripsy, so the techniques people use for uh, treating uh, kidney stones, this is not, the layer sum is no longer very effective. Uh, the reason is because the laser tripsy, the bubble collapsing time can span over hundreds of microseconds. And also the, the bubble can be very sparsely uh, spaced um, rather than very confined, uh, being very confined. Um, so the conventional delay sum approach, you know, you can make it work, but it's not very effective. You know, it takes a very long time to, to locate where the bubble is at. So, so just, you know, uh, two years ago, we tried this approach. I thought, you know, when the bubble collapse, basically it's like, uh, uh, it's like, you know, you're sending out a spherical wave, right? So imagine that the wave spread out. Imagine this it was a movie. You can play the movie backwards. Then you can trace back to where the bubble is at. So, so essentially what we are doing is something called uh, this spectral propagation. So let me show you what I mean. So, um, so there are some bubbles that are collapsing here, generating cavitation. We have a linear ultrasound array here that is picking up the ultrasound signal. Okay, so now I play the movie backwards and uh, you can see what happens. So the way it converge, right? Maybe let's do this again. Okay, so you can see, for example, there's a wave, separate wave that converge. That's the, the, at the convergence, that's where the bubble is at. And what happens after that is the wave kind of spread out again because the computer doesn't know that's where the wave stops. Right, so it's because the wave station has two solutions, the conversion wave and the diverging wave. So it had to tell you two possibilities, but we know there's only when the conversion stops there, because that's where the bubble is at. Okay, so we can use this approach to not only find out where the bubbles are, but we can also find out at what time the bubble uh, the, the cavitation happens. So you get spatial and temporal information rather than just a spatial information. Okay, so um we are a collaborator at Duke, uh, Pedro, uh, and uh, Dr. Jinjie Yao. They have this very nice setup where they can um, use cameras to, to see where the bubbles are and see uh, the cavitation. So, uh, so basically, we have a um, imaging ultrasound transducer here, uh, and uh, we have a shock uh, wave generator and that is kind of sending out wave in the other plane direction. And that's generating some bubbles here. And uh, the, the camera is actually going to project all the bubbles into a 2D plane. And, and that's going to make it very hard to tell where the bubbles are. We want to know 3D spatial information bubbles. So we have a very nice setup with these two uh, lights, uh, blue lights and the red lights to generate two plane images and they kind of extrapolate the 3D information of the bubbles from the two planes. So, so anyway, this is a red channel, this is a blue channel. By using these two planes, they can actually uh, uh, estimate the way the bubbles are in the 3D domain. So that's an excellent point. Great question. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying you got a question. <laughs> so do you have a detection of those bubbles when they're bust or when they are generated? So these are the bubbles going out, they are being generated. And uh, after a little while, they're gonna collapse. And so like, a, do we know when they collapse? Like how large, uh, can you infer that from? That's, that's, that's why you need to uh, use the, uh, the, what I just showed you, the, uh, kind of the algorithm that we developed to tell when- So you can estimate the time. When, when they were first. And also where. Because the bubbles, they don't just stay there, they move around a little bit. Um, so when they collapse, they don't necessarily stay at that position. 
Um, okay, so we kind of project all the bubbles into a 2D plane because we're doing 2D image. So this is a linear array that we have. Some of the bubbles may be on the plane actually, so we actually not, we may not be able to see those bubbles. Actually. But um, you know, if we can see all the bubbles, there will be like 19 bubbles. Um, so we first use active cavitation mapping. What we do is that we send an ultrasound pulse and we look at the, the echo. So if the bubbles are there, uh, bubbles are very good at reflecting sound. So this is called active uh, cavitation mapping. Uh, you can see some of the uh, bubbles from the ultrasound image lines up very well with the camera, but some of those are not seen on the active cavitation mapping. Image because, of, like I said, some bubbles are out of plane. I can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, so, since the bubble is existing just for a very short amount of time, maybe say 100 microseconds, how do you know you send out an ultrasonic wave, you're actually um, hitting on those bubbles and get an echo back? Maybe they are already disappeared or uh, is it possible? Let's say you generate a bubble with air. <laughs> They existing only for 100 microseconds yeah. and then collapse disappeared. But you send the ultrasound away, ultrasound is propagating, that takes time. And then, where the ultrasound travels to that location, maybe the bubble is gone. So, how do you solve that problem? I think that's maybe there's some limitation to this approach. Um, I had to maybe. Uh, after the, the group at Duke, maybe they would know this better than I do. But this is the, the best way to come up with. This. But I think there are certain, certainly there are limitations. Yeah. So, so this is active uh, cavitation mapping. And at this point, the bubble is still there, right? But then afterwards, we use uh, delay and some. Uh, like I said, you can still make delay and some work, but they are not very effective and using our new. Newly developed algorithm and the spectrum approach, you can tell uh, where the bubbles are collapsing. You can see that they don't you know, overlap with the original bubble location very well. Like I said, the bubbles kind of move a little bit. Um, and also, um, you can see that there are definitely more than like 19 or 9 bubbles there. The reason you can bubble the collapse, the general new bubbles, smaller bubbles, keep collapsing. Um, but overall, we see a very good agreement between. Um, first of all, we see at least, um, you know, we, we, we don't see bubbles here or there, right? So there's very, still some kind of consistency there, but, and also a very good agreement between the epsilon and angular spectrum. And in this case, the, the delay of sum is about 10 times slower than our new algorithm. We want to have, be able to you know, get this information uh, very fast, so the speed is very important. Uh, so this is now the figure showing what we can do. So as I, the previous figure shows the spatial information of the bubbles. We can also get the temporal location, temporal information of the bubbles. Right? We can know when do we have you know, bubbles collapse. Right? So if we can project all the bubbles to a lateral dimension, then now we have this time domain here. So this is some delay and some. So for example, at 140 uh, microseconds, you see some one, two, three, four, five, something like that. And see the same same thing here. Okay, so that's just another application uh, for cavitation mapping. Um, let's move on to inhomogeneous media. Uh, this is especially important for transcranial ultrasound, and I'm very interested in um, brain brain ultrasound. Uh, the reason is because you can do so many things with the brain and how pointing set aside on each brain initiative. Uh, but even for like soft tissue, there's something about abdomen, there's a, there's a fat, there's a connective tissue, there's a muscle, they all have, you know, sort of different acoustic properties. So we're talking about speed is down, density and attenuation coefficient. So they can give you some, you know, distortion of ultrasound. So you wanted to be able to, to predict uh, how that would affect the propagation of ultrasound. Uh, so this is just an, an example of showing you the effect of the soft. Right? So this is a basically a pressure distribution uh, uh, from a transducer uh, on the focal plane. So you can see a very sharp um, focus there. Once you add, as soon as you add it in the skull, you can see the uh, focus kind of shifted to another location. And you, have, you also have very strong silos. Um, so 
this is obviously not what we want to have when you do therapeutic ultrasound in the brain. I guess uh, this becomes a safety issue. So, but you know, if we can have understanding by solving the wave equation, can predict how the, uh, the wave propagates through the skull, and we can come up with some approach, a solution to that problem. Right, so here, this is the some new equation that we need to solve that takes into account of the homogeneity of the media. Um, so it's a quick comparison between the previous equations. So you can see mainly the difference between uh, is, that's the first term. This one can see the, the density here. Density becomes a function of space. Uh, also, the speed of sound is also a function of space, whereas in this case, the C, uh, speed of sound is just a constant. Same thing for the attenuation coefficient. This is a function of space. This is constant. And the non-energy coefficient can also be a function of space. So anything can be a function of space. So this is a very generalized equation. Uh, uh, a little bit harder to solve, though. Um, but I would just say that the solution method is similar to the previous one. So we kind of are solving, we are solving this by using the one experience function again. So I don't want to get too much into the technical details here. Uh, so here is a very simple case. As we have a transducer here, we have some uh, you know different uh, crystal media. This is water. This is a uh, fat. This is a tumor. Some kind of imaginary setup. They all have different speed, sound density, attenuation coefficient, and non energy coefficient. Okay, so the so wave propagates downwards. So we can here. Okay, so this is our model. This is a full wave model. You can see what the difference is that we can predict the location of the waveform. You know, this is at a certain you know, time instance, so it's a snapshot of a waveform. However, what we are missing is the reflection. So you can see the reflection here from a full wave model. In this case, it's still okay because we have very weak uh, reflection. This is soft tissue problem. Uh, but when you have the skull, you have to be able to consider reflection because that becomes very strong. Uh, but we figured out a way to do that because we can do one way propagation, so we just treat this reflection as another one way propagation, and second one reflection as another one propagation. Just do that, so um, and still make this work. Uh, so this is just you know kind of showing you a movie of wave propagation in the um, soft tissue that is heterogeneous, uh, very weak reflection, right? Uh, if you go once you go to the skull, you can see the reflection gets much bigger. Yeah. So um, last year when I was, uh, you know, I participated in a study where um, this is a paper in which I got most authors in the paper. Um, basically, we have about I think ten groups from all over the world. We each have our own group solver. So we we're not trying to decide which solver is the best. That's kind of hard for me. Um, we're just trying to compare our model and see. If we have some consistency there. Um, so, this M sound is the one that I developed. Um, I made it open source, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But there are other models that we, you know, we try to we look at a specific problem where it involves wave propagation through the skull. They took a CT scan of the skull to so show the skull. Yeah, and this just shows me one cross section of the wave field. It's K wave, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with K wave. So K wave is a full wave model, so it's supposed to be very accurate. So our model is, you know, gives very similar results, but at a speed that is maybe two orders of magnitude faster because we are we don't solve in the time domain. We don't have that time dimension. So that's why it's fast. It's not the plane, not the cross section. Um, some further comparison. I think that's it. Um, so that is that we we uh, I was uh, in each grant we were able to uh, write this uh, you know build this software open source software so we made it publicly available it's called Amsound and uh, we had some you know functions so we can solve uh, wave propagation in one D two D and three D uh, so we have. <clears throat> instructions on how to use different examples. So far, we have 16 examples. Um, and in each example, it shows you what, exactly what you need to do to kind of replicate or modify the code to do whatever you need to do. Um, so, 
Yeah, so, okay. Um, I just wanted to maybe, uh, okay. Uh, the other way to solve the same equation is to apply the Fourier transform to x, y, and z. Okay, so what you end up with is having the equation in the time domain. So you now you're marching the solution in the time domain rather than in the z dimension. Um, so I just wanted to quickly show this kind of different uh, um, way to solve the same equation. But in this case, you start with the initial time, you know the pressure at the, that time, and then you march in the time domain. So you, you get to predict at the next time instance uh, what the pressure field is like, okay? So the advantage of, so k wave is basically based on this uh, approach. And I, I also work on, I was working on this uh, approach a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a pros and cons for this case-based approach. Uh, you can actually have arbitrary shape of source as opposed to in the previous approach, you have to assume the source plane is planar, which is kind of a limitation there. Um, and it's a full wave solver, so you can do multiple reflection very easily. Everything is included in the um, algorithm. And the limitation is that it's a very slow for time harmonic problems. It's because you have x, y, and you also have to have the consider time domain. Okay, um, so, but full wave model, there's, you know, very um, interesting application for this, which is transferring your focusing. Uh, so we want to make sure how you focus ultrasound through the skull. The skull is there to kind of uh, distort the ultrasound, right? So one way we uh, approach that has been widely adopted is to use time reversal. So again, uh, I should wait a little bit until this restart. So imagine we wanted to focus on this on here. So what you do is that you first conduct simulation by putting a point source here. So you can see the wave spreads out and it's going to interact with the skull. You have reflection and you have multiple scattering, refraction, everything is there. Um, now imagine that you have a, a linear ultrasound array that picks up all the signal and then you time reverse it and you send it back. So you send it back, and according to the wave equation, which obeys time reversal, you are guaranteed to have a very nice focusing at the desired location. Let's see how the wave can converge to that location where you started out with the point source. So that's the beauty of time reversal. Um, so we did some experiment to verify this. Uh, we have a skull here, we have a linear array, so before any correction, phase correction by doing time reversal, um, because the linear array, so the focusing is supposed to be like a line. We can we actually get two lines because it's defocus. Okay. After we apply the, uh, the phase correction, we can get much, much better focusing along this line. Uh, you can also use time reversal to do photocoast imaging. So photocoast imaging, and many of you are familiar with photocoast imaging, I guess. So you shine laser, right? Then you have a thermal elastic effect. So you generate a pressure field that will kind of spread out like this. So here I have a linear array. And I pick up this ultrasound signal. Then you can, again, do a time reversal. You send the wave back in a time reverse manner. So the equation tells you that eventually the wave will converge and that will deform the shape of the blood vessel. So there, so you get the blood and um, So, you know, for homogeneous case, you can do the lamp sound. So, but for transcranial, again, for transcranial uh, ultrasound, uh, you have to uh, do time reversal to consider the effect of the skull. So if you do simple delay and sound, you get an image. This is the best image you can get, which is still kind of blurred, not sharp enough. But if you do a time reversal, um, you get a better image. For time reversal to work, do you have to assume the loss is minimal? So that's the question. If, if there's a loss, you're not supposed to have time to reverse the yeah. So if, normally, if you if the loss is small enough, you can still assume this time reversal symmetry. But even for skull, the loss is pretty large. Um, you can still get reasonable. Okay. Um, 
but physically speaking, it, there's lots of Okay, so this is probably the last part of my talk here. So recently we are working on something I think really interesting, which is we are to do time reversal, you have to know the, the score. So you can take a CT scan of the score, but you know, you have to do another CT scan. Don't be, most people don't like CT scans, right? Um, we are trying to figure out if we can use ultrasound to extrapolate the shape of the skull and the crystal properties of the skull. So you can use that as an input to do time reversal. Okay, so we thought maybe can we use deep learning? Since like everybody's using deep learning nowadays. Okay, so we did some uh, preliminary study. Um, actually, I was uh, working with my uh, one of my colleagues who was at UIUC and just recently received a Trail Blazer grant on this project. So basically, we take uh, we I have some CT scan of the stable human skulls. So basically, we look at 2D slices of the CT scan. We just take some segments and we orient. The skull like this, and we put a linear right here. Okay. Um, so we kind of scan the active elements, ultrasound elements along this direction. For every scan, we focus ultrasound here. What we our hope is to uh, be able to, after so many scans, to, to uh, extrapolate information for, for each segment here. We want to extrapolate the thickness of that segment, also the speed of sound, average speed of sound. So uh, every time you do a photo save, you get uh, echoes back, right? So this is the uh, um, channel data from the echo. We actually do a Fourier transform into a frequency domain. So we actually get two parts, into the real part and the imaginary part. And we feed that into our deep learning model. So I'm not uh, smart enough to tell you more about what is shown there. Because, uh, that's, I'm not an expert on deep learning, but this is, again, my colleague at UIUC uh, developed this model. We're trying to use this deep learning to predict the thickness of the skull and the speed of sound. So, um, so we first use synthetic aperture imaging to kind of see where the outer shape of the skull is. So we just get a rough estimation of the position of the outer uh, shape. So we can see that pretty grace pretty well with the actual skull there. And uh, this is the ground truth speed of sound map of the skull. And using our you know deep learning predictive thickness and acoustic. A speed of wave, uh, sound, we can get a, uh, a speed of sound map of the skull, which is shape wise, I think, pretty similar. Right? And the speed of sound, I guess, like I said, we can only get the average kind of speed of sound. We cannot really get, uh, you know, the skull is actually a three layer structure. You have the dense, two layers dense, and you have a very porous layer in the middle. That's, you know, we're hoping maybe in the future we can maybe get both details about that. But right now, we can only get averages. Uh, we actually, uh, you know, we compared our deep learning predicted speed of sound and thickness with the ground truth. We actually get pretty, pretty decent uh, agreement. So let's do some. Uh, once we have the information on the skull, we can do face correction. We can see how that improves the image. imaging. Right? So let's try to image 12 uh, wires. Uh, this is without skull, so just water. Uh, this is with skull without doing any correction. You can see um, we are not really identifying the location correctly, identifying the locations of the wires that kind of also um, emerge, um, blurred image, right? Um, so if you um, use the ground truth of the skull information to do face correction, you get a much better, much improved image there. And by using the uh, properties of the skull predicted by deep learning, you can get almost equally uh, good results. <laughs> and that's all for my talk. I just want to uh, thank the IEEE uh, UFC Star Ambassador Lectureship uh, that is partially sponsoring my visit here. Actually, I, I received this back in 2020. I never, this is my first time using this because, because COVID, I couldn't travel. Um, actually, um, just a couple of months ago, I was going to travel to the IUC to give a talk. Uh, and the, the flight was canceled because we had a bird strike. So, so this is my first time using this uh, um, award. So, very happy I can do that finally. Uh, and uh, my collaborators, Junjie was you know, helping us doing some photographs imaging and cavitation, uh, along with Dr. Pei Zhong from Duke. 
and uh, uh, Professor Han uh, just moved his machine attack, he's uh, uh, helping us do some deep learning for the current screen ultrasound. Uh, Jonathan's uh, histosonics and provided with us data to do shockwave modeling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the whole question, um, when you do the time reversal, great talk by the way. Thank you. Uh, when you do the time reversal um, modeling um, and the one like skull for the <clears throat> high intensity focus ultrasound yeah. kind of thing, when you do the backwards propagation, you're modeling and going out in sort of like all dimensions or all angles, and you're only capturing a subset of that on the linear kind yeah. of transducer. Yeah. Are there any um, Weird, like harmonic issues you have with like clipping the spectrum when you go back. Or have you found anything that's? Uh... Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, you don't get harmonics, but you do get imperfect imperfect of, uh, focusing. So you're right. If you can't get a full angle coverage, you get very very tight focus, almost like point. But if you only, if you can only if your transducer is only this large, and your focus is not going to be a point, it's going to be elongated shape. And then so in that in that just kind of bubble quick. So is the goal to try to put the transducer sort of as close to the spell as possible to like maximize the solid angle you can get? So the closer will help. Okay. Uh, but we're just trying to improve the focusing. So anything better than without using. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. That's all uh, how do you justify uh, the sound diffusivity term and the nonlinear term, where uh, how do they contribute to the photoacoustic imaging and integrity of the sound? Like, when like several photoacoustic imaging methods, they don't, they typically don't consider those two terms for, uh, for yeah. the modeling as well as the reconstruction. So, okay, so for um, absorption, the diffusivity term, absorption basically, um, some people do that actually in the photoacoustic imaging. Like when they do time reversal, they would basically reverse the sound of the absorption so we amplify the sound, which is going to cause issue because it's also going to amplify the noise, right? So I think that's the kind of reason why people don't really pay attention to the absorption. Um, in soft tissue, it's very weak anyway. Yes. Uh, Nonlinearity, I don't think for imaging that's what it means because I think the pressure is just so low, you don't get that much nonlinearity. Yeah. Mostly it's relevant to therapeutic problems, I think. Any question from the Zoom audience? Okay, I have a question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in combined light and ultrasound to reduce that. Uh, so, can you simulate uh, what's the mechanism why the combined photon with ultrasound that reduce the threshold of the bubble generation? Or yeah. The size of bubble will be different. <clears throat> right, so uh, I, I know there are people who are working on that. So one way to do that is to do, and we have actually have done something um, along the line of bubble dam. So you have to model, model bubble dynamics. So what you do is that um, the bubble dynamics, the input to that is the pressure with a pressure field. So, you know, usually we just do ultrasound, but now you have, if you have a laser, you have to combine these two pressure fields because laser generate the pressure. So you add up the data generated pressure with the oxygen pressure and use that overall pressure as input to bubble dynamics model. And so what you model is like the radius of the bubble as a function of time. So, in, in, so when we look at cavitation, we have certain criteria that we use to tell, okay, this is when you have cavitation. Uh, roughly, you never really know when you have cavitation, but roughly speaking, some people assume that when the bubble radius becomes twice of the original bubble radius, you get a cavitation. Um, some people look at the, the, uh, the derivative, time derivative of the, of the radius. Once they go beyond certain value, they consider that as cavitation. So the interaction assumption is the median, it's the pressure generated by photon plus generated by Right, so you're still not really at the top, yes. Right, right. That's true, yeah. Is there a way you can do experiments to confirm that? Right? You have experiments. Of the bubble generation using reverse. Uh, so if you're adding the, the photon, whether the you know, same process will happen or different process will happen. Yeah, well, I think that would be interesting to study. I'm not experimenting. <laughs> Any other question? 
Any question from the Zoom audience? Okay, no question. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>